Hey, two questions. Uh, when we talk about China, my impression was that China was under the complete control, direct control of the New World Order. No. That's why they had a, a secret no. security council. Wrong. I think this is always an illusion. The idea that Russia and China are integral parts of something called the New World Order, I think, is, is simply wrong. It, 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 it comes from, I think, from not knowing much about these countries. Well, let me Certainly. stop you for a minute, Webster. I want to hear what you have to say on this, but let me be clear. The West, the British and others, clearly, it's part of the historical record, funded a lot of the Bolsheviks. Then once Lenin got out of there, Stalin ran Trotsky out, so the West turned against him. Uh, we know Putin did arrest a bunch of the oligarchs uh, when he was vice president and then president. And it was all over the news that Rothschilds and Rockefellers were the real owners. That came out in, like the Times of London. Uh, and, and we know China did sign deals with the U.S. in the 70s to set up the eugenics one-child policy and all this. So we know they did deals with them. But still, in any mafia situation, you're going to have different families in the system fighting with each other. We've had Russia and China call for their own New World Order. And I'm sure if they were in the position of the British, they would have tried some of the same systems. So, so there's certainly collusion at points, but it's like a group of pirate ships in an armada out robbing people. You are going to have different historical shifts and changes. But no, th this whole system isn't one monolith, but the management system of the technocracy is the same art form. You, you go through phases. You can say in the 1990s, when you had Yeltsin in Moscow, he was a U.S. puppet. When you had Jiang Zemin in Beijing, this is somebody who wants globalization. He wants to work with the U.S. and the British. Now you have Putin, uh, I think behind the scenes still, who is a Russian nationalist who says, no, we are not the colony and the plantation of the U.S. and the British. And you've got this youth league faction in China. Well, let me stop you again. That's key because... Putin's got a lot of problems, and, and Russia does all sorts of you know, serious things that I don't agree with. But the Russian government pays people to have children because their population is dying. It's the only Western country trying to reverse the death of the West. So it's clear that Russia is breaking with the eugenicist. Yes, and, and of course the, the question is there are, there, there are factions. There's a pro-British faction. There's a monetarist faction inside Russia and similarly in China. The Shanghai Mafia, the Jiang Zemin faction, thinks they're going to take over the presidency with this guy Xi, that's X-I, right? That's the guy who's supposed to be the next president of China in about two years from this uh, autumn. So you've got to look concretely, empirically, about what the controls are. So I would say right now, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization powers Russia and China are in greater conflict with the U.S. and the British, certainly, than they were Ten years ago, so the Russian Chinese, so, so the Russian Chinese split is baloney. Well, again, you've got the British in there, and and of course the U.S. and the CIA are trying to do everything they can to divide and conquer, and that's the first place, right? That's the the, the dream scenario for Brzezinski is that you could have a war between Russia and China. That would be the, the acme of of Brzezinski's uh, achievement, and and that's very. Very widely shared, right? You can look at uh, a report from the Office of Net Assessment in the Pentagon through the uh, Hudson Institute, which talks about the Great Siberian War of the year 2030, which is precisely that, Russia against China. So there's a whole crew of kooks in the Pentagon who, and the Foreign Office who think that that's possible. But I would, I would warn people, the idea that there's an integral sort of seamless integration of Russia and China into the U.S.-British banking system is wrong it's just you're saying true. that's more of a long-term integration fantasy of brzezinski and kissinger but s certainly china has adopted the centralization of the un and the whole e e eugenical uh system russia more than china has been rebuking and exposing global warming as a fraud uh wait, and, wait, wait. if you look at the copenhagen conference the, the resistance against global warming was led by Premier Wen. Now, he did it in a typical Chinese way. He did it in this indirect, you could call it an inscrutable strategy. But using Sudan and using some third world countries, it was essentially in Copenhagen, it was Obama against Wen to see if they could impose this carbon dictatorship. And the answer was no. In other words, Wen came out on top. The Prime Minister of China vanquished Obama. And he did a service to the world. So 
They are not included in this planning. Unfortunately, they pay lip service to a lot of these things. The Chinese pay lip service to free trade, even though they don't practice it. They have good sense. They, they pay lip service to this carbon global warming stuff. Uh, they're not in a, in a strong ideological position, but they okay, do. Let's move fight. on. Let's move on to some more calls. Good points, Webster. Adam in Canada, you're on the air. Yeah, hello? Yeah, come on. You're on the air worldwide, sir. Yeah, I just wondered if uh, uh, what Webster had to say about state banks like the one in North Dakota, an initiative right now uh, to establish them in Oregon, Vermont, and especially in Florida, where Dr. Farid Kabari has this idea of a zero-cost economy. Yeah, that's a, a good idea I've seen with state banks, some real state banks set up in the last hundred years that give people really low-cost credit and aren't part of the private banking cartel. Webster? Look, the, the state bank is a fine thing, but it's a little thing. It's a, it's a marginal difference. North Dakota, uh, I guess, has low unemployment because if you're unemployed in North Dakota, you leave. Then there are very few people left in North Dakota. So North Dakota is a very bad example. But on the other hand, it, it's fine if you're going to do this along the way. But don't think this is going to cause an economic recovery. Much better, in my view, and right now the subject of a big world movement is the Tobin tax. It's called the Robin Hood tax now. In Britain, in the Labour Party and the trade unions, there are a bunch of people who realize that they are doomed unless they get some left populist cover. And Webster, we got to go to break, but i got to say this. London. Webster, the UN's been pushing the Tobin tanks. The, 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 the yeah, bigger credit... Hold which on. Kind? Which kind? The Tobin tax of the UN and Sarkozy is let's have a tax uh, globally run by the UN and the money goes to the International Monetary Fund. Obviously not. But inside Europe, you've got people going with the Robin Hood tax, the financial transaction That's tax. what I was about to say. Okay, stay there. We're going to come back after the break with Webster Griffin Tarbley as we cover a wide range of subjects. <laughs>